Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Building Bridges to the Community lecture series. And tonight I'm joined by some of my favorite colleagues and friends from across our entire Northwell Health System. We have people um, from all the different um, territories uh, just showing how great a group of women heart doctors we have. And it's going to be a little different than our typical setup. Normally we have a lecture and then question and answers. Today we're going to have a nice conversation about women's heart disease and just really we want to hear from you and your questions specifically so there is a question and answer section so please put your questions in we're going to try at the end of the hour to get to as many of those as we can and to start us all off we're very lucky to have our own dr tara narula our associate uh, director for women's heart disease at lennox hill who's also a senior correspondent for cbs news and happens to have some skills in the area of moderating. So she is going to lead this whole conversation uh, for us uh, tonight. So take it over, Tara, thank you. Thank you so much, Eugenia. And it's such a pleasure to see all of these amazing female faces tonight uh, and hopefully to be educating everyone who's listening. So I wanna start off by just introducing our panel. Um, you just heard from my colleague and partner in crime, Dr. Eugenia Gianos. She is the System Director for Cardiovascular Prevention at Northwell Health, as well as the Director for Women's Heart Health at Lenox Health Hospital. Uh, we have joining us as well, Dr. Evelina Graver, who is the director of the Women's Heart Program at Katz Women's Institute, Sandra Atlas Bat Heart Hospital, North Shore University Hospital, and LIJ Medical Center. Dr. Jean Ketchabaudo, who is the medical director at Huntington Hospital. Dr. Dina Katz, who's a senior cardiology attending at Phelps Memorial Hospital, Sleepy Hollow, and clinical cardiologist at Northwell Briarcliff Manor. Dr. Roshini Malani, who's preventative cardiology and women's health at Staten Island University Hospital. And we do have another guest who will be joining us hopefully in a little bit. Um, and that will be Dr. Stacey Rosen, who is the Senior Vice President of Women's Health at the Katz Institute for Women's Health. So thank you all for, for joining us tonight. We're excited to, to talk about the whole spectrum uh, of women and cardiovascular disease and the different issues. So I wanna start off, um, Eugenia, with you uh, and uh, just a general question. What are some of the unique syndromes that affect women? So the most common, I, I think we should keep in mind that the most common bread and butter type of cardiology issue we see is plaque in the arteries. And that's what men and women both are at risk for and that we probably don't recognize enough in women. So having said that, there are unique uh, syndromes, as you mentioned. Sometimes you can have a tear in the artery of the wall um, without having plaque. It's called a dissection. Uh, there are stress-related uh, syndromes that are related to emotion and that potentially can lead to a weakening of the heart muscle. Um, there are also syndromes that um, specifically could affect only the small vessels and not the actual main arteries of the heart. So these are some unique types of syndromes and sometimes there are unique symptoms that women have um, that we really have to know how to care for when we're taking care of women with heart disease. Um, that was great. And I think that leads me to Roshini. Uh, I want to ask you just to start off because many women, particularly young women, think that cardiovascular disease affects older women. Um, is this something that just older women need to worry about? Or do women who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s also need to pay attention to their risk for cardiovascular disease? Um, this is definitely not a disease of only older women. Um, as we I mean, you may or may not know, heart disease starts at a really young age. It starts developing over time. And they've, been, they've had many studies that have been done that there are other risk factors that influence the development of heart disease starting at a younger age. And one of those things is diabetes. Um, being obese or overweight that can increase your risk um, at a younger age. And we are definitely seeing um, heart attacks in women that are under the age of 55, which, um, you know, that is, is not as well recognized as um, it is in older women. So it's really, really important to have the risk factors um, evaluated by your doctor, know your family history um, and uh, be physically active, you know, stay away from smoking and, and things like that. Um, I think that's a great jumping off point uh, for Evelina. I know you deal a lot with women and pregnancy issues. And for many women, the only interaction they have 
uh, in their younger ages is with their OBGYN. So what does a woman need to know uh, when she's interested in getting pregnant? Uh, what does she need to pay attention to to have a healthy pregnancy when it comes to her cardiovascular uh, disease? So, Taryn, thank you. That's a great, great question. Um, ideally, it's exactly what you said. Ideally, I'd love to be able to see some of these women preconception before they even uh, consider getting pregnant. Um, in the past, in the past, they, the thought process was the fact that heart disease and pregnancy was a one-way street, meaning those women that only had uh, heart disease should be seen preconceptually um, with a cardio by a cardiologist to see how their pregnancy will actually map out. We now know the fact that it's more of a two-way street, uh, meaning the fact that the pregnancy can actually be sort of as acting as a failed stress test because the body goes through significant amount of physiological changes during the time of the pregnancy, and that could put a significant strain on the heart itself. So the women that actually should be seen are those women that actually, like I said before, those that do have uh, known cardiac disease, that were born with congenital heart disease, that do have known um, arrhythmias, that do have underlying risk factors as well, such as diabetes, such as hypertension, such as obesity, and such as what we like to refer to as the metabolic syndrome. Some women, even with polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, should sometimes be seen as well, because once again, polycystic ovarian syndrome is at times also related with that metabolic syndrome, where women have a touch of elevated cholesterol, a touch of elevated sugars that could really uh, put their pregnancy at significant cardiovascular risk. That was great. And, and I want to bounce off of something you referenced, which was stress testing. And, you know, I think for a lot of women, particularly at long, younger ages, they're wondering, should I have a stress test? When should I have a stress test? What are the indications for that? So Jean, I want to ask you that question. You know, when should a woman have a stress test? What is the appropriate indication? Oh, you know, it was, it's so much cleaner for the men because <laughs> there's an age and a, and a, you know, a, a guidelines to follow. For women, it is not as clear cut. Um, I, I think the most important message um, about stress testing starts with your relationship with your physician and having uh, or being in the care of someone that listens to you, that you can have good dialogue and conversations about and really understands you. Um, because uh, sometimes stress tests are not the right test to answer a particular question. And there's some really fabulous testing available now. There's the cardiac um, CTA. It's, a, it's an actual CT angiogram that allows you to look at the inside of the vessels, which is really, really valuable. And a lot of the more recent um, studies looking at um, risk stratification actually are more based on knowing what the anatomy is. So what anatomically, when we talk about stress testing, it's a functional assessment of the heart. So it's, a, it's more of a test on how well the plumbing supplies the heart muscle, uh, as opposed to an anatomic test that actually goes in and identifies exactly where the blockages are. So uh, stress testing has its role. Um, there's three different stress tests that we are using um, in the current uh, uh, state of cardiology. One is just a treadmill test. And for women, particularly young women, we know that estrogen, which is high in our bodies um, when we're premenopausal, is structurally related to a cardiac medication called the Joxin that can cause false positive tests. So a regular treadmill test in a young woman wouldn't necessarily be an ideal starting point. You want to add some imaging and picture taking. Uh, and so we have echocardiograms, which is a sound wave test of your heart. It's a great test to look at the structure of the heart. Um, if there's any um, abnormal valves, which could also, if when there's a valve abnormality, could be contributing to a symptom of chest pain. And then there's nuclear imaging, 
which is a test where we um, inject a low-level radioactive tracer into your vein through an IV and allows us to take pictures, kind of creates a map of blood flow to the heart muscle. And we take a picture at rest. We then put our patient through a stress test, whether it's walking on a treadmill or using a medication to recreate the conditions of exercise. And then we take a picture of blood flow after that stress test portion and compare the two. So uh, it, it, I, I think when it comes to stress testing um, and really all testing, not just in cardiology, but in medicine, it's about knowing your, the question you're asking and picking the right test to answer that question. Um, so formulating a question is probably one of, uh, can be one of the more challenging things we do in medicine. And that's why that partnership between a patient and their physician is really important because it helps you get to the crux of the situation. Well, that was such a fantastic uh, answer and so much information packed in there. Um, I have to say, uh, I love CTAs. I was recently told I order the most CTAs of any provider at Lenox Hill. Um, so I'm a big fan. Uh, but coming back to exercise um, and treadmill tests and just exercise in general, I want to ask Dina, what types of exercise do you recommend to your patients? How much, what form, what is the best uh, regimen to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease? Thank you, Tara. That's a great question. And I love to talk about exercise because I myself am an exercise fanatic. And I think we all should be because exercise has unbelievable good effects on the cardio. I mean, the Things like um, decreasing depression, increasing our mood, decreasing our stress level. But um, exercise also has great effects on the endothelium, on the inside lining of the blood vessels. It allows vessels to be more elastic so we can get more blood flow through the blood vessels and that lowers blood pressure by increasing our insulin sensitivity and has fantastic effects on the lipid panel. So it raises the good HDL, the good uh, cholesterol, and lowers the bad cholesterol and lowers the triglyceride. It actually changes the particle size of the LDL bad cholesterol. Um, it, it allows the heart to pump more blood efficiently and it also trains the muscles uh, of the body, the arms and the legs, to really deal with the oxygen delivery a lot better. So exercise has so many, so many good uh, characteristics on the cardiovascular system. So what type of exercise is best? Really any kind of exercise. Oh, I think we just lost Dina. We're having some yeah. technical Zoom issues, so. I'll finish up for her just because there was, a, oh, there she oh, is. there she is. So now you're on mute, actually, you're Dina. You're muted, Dina. Hmm. Dina, you're on mute, actually. So, okay. well, okay. All right, okay. Um, so, um, you know, there's been a lot of really good um, women's health studies that we're all familiar with, the Women's Health Initiative, the Women's Health Study, the Nurses' Health Study. And all together, if we add them up, they've studied probably 500,000 women. And each one had some sub-studies on women and exercise. And what we found from those is that even sitting raises your cardiovascular risk. So anything you can do besides sitting is good. We've also learned through those studies that even moderate exercise is good. You don't have to go do vigorous ex exercise. There's actually a sweet spot for exercise. For instance, in running, you don't have to be a marathon runner. The sweet spot is someone who runs only about three days a week, maybe one to two uh, miles, yet they get the most benefit, even more than the ultra athletes. Um, so our societies do recommend 150 minutes a week in exercise. So if you do the math, that's about 21 minutes a day. You don't have to do it all at once. It can be done in pockets of five minutes, of, you know, four times a day or, or 10 minutes twice a day. Um, and if you're doing vigorous ex exercise, you have to do about half of that, 75 mil minutes a day. Um, so a lot of people say they don't have time. So there's also interval training, which you might've heard of. Um, 
if anyone owns a Peloton, they might know, they might've heard of the Tabata rides. So Dr. Tabata was a doctor in Japan who came up with this regimen where you only have to work for four minutes a day to achieve cardiovascular benefit. And you really do. I mean, there's many, many forms of this, but his is one where you exercise vigorously for 20 seconds, followed by rest for 10 seconds. And you do that a number of times, eight times. So there are many, many options. Of course, things like strength training is important for our bones and our joints, um, Pilates, really any type of exercise. And, and I wanna give a shout out to yoga, a special shout out, because yoga, of course, is good for flexibility, balance, mindfulness. And there are studies that it decreases blood pressure, it decreases your weight, it decreases your heart rate. And it even decreases the amount of an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. And there was a nice study in 2017 that showed if you do yoga along with an aerobic exercise, then you have double the benefit. So really all exercise, moderate amount. Um, and it's more about the, just the duration. Well, that, that makes me feel good, particularly the part about only needing to run uh, a mile or two a couple times a week. Um, I may have to adjust my regimen. So um, I want to jump back to you, Eugenia. Uh, we've talked about stress testing. Um, how do you approach assessing risk in women? Do you use any sort of additional tests, whether that's genetic testing or other imaging? I think what Dr. Kachabato, um, who was my teacher as well, uh, uh, my amazing teacher, um, pointed out is really you important. You feel old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you taught me all along as a colleague, that is. There you go. Um, you know, you, what you pointed out is it's, it's the relationship between the patient and the uh, physician that is very important. And, and it really is about individualized testing and figuring out exactly what each patient needs. You know, it's not optimal to sort of send every single blood test in the world and put the patient through every single imaging scan and et cetera, just, you know, because we want to be thorough. That doesn't necessarily mean benefit and it can actually mean harm, especially if those studies involve a lot of radiation. Um, having said that, we always weigh the benefits and the risks and a lot of times the benefits of doing a test are worthwhile. Uh, so for me, it really depends on, you know, what is that, uh, the suspicion of there being some blockage that is putting the patient at risk at the moment that we should fix, because if we don't fix it, the patient is at risk. And then the second question after we've addressed that is, what is the patient's risk in the future of having a problem? How do we prevent something? So there are two different questions that we're answering. We're usually answering what's going on acutely in the patient there. And then the second one is, what do we need you know, for the future? And each one requires different types of testing. Um, I'm a big fan of the CAT uh, CTA, which is somebody asked if that was an invasive procedure. Essentially, it is simply um, a CAT scan with IV contrast. You get an IV put in, and you get an injection of dye. And we can see the anatomy of the arteries and whether or not there's a blockage. Um, so for me, I think finding out you know, in that way, it is helpful because even if there's small amounts of plaque, we know that we need to be more aggressive and do things. Um, there's, again, in certain patients, I need to do stress tests. I use stress echo quite a bit. Sometimes I'll use a regular treadmill stress test depending on the patient's risk to begin with. And then um, there's a lot of other things that we can send off if we think a patient has a strong family history, for example something called a lipoprotein A, which is often associated with heart disease risk, which is not um, appreciated very often, that may trigger more aggressive care. There's something called a calcium score that we use to look to see if somebody has early evidence of plaque in their arteries on a simple CAT scan that would guide us to use a, um, a statin medication. So there's a lot of different tools. The good thing is we have a lot of things that we can use and we can individualize it to the right patient, fortunately. Um, so we're talking a lot tonight about risk and how we figure out what risk is. Rashini, I wanna ask you, for a lot of people, they have a strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Does that mean that they should throw their hands up in the air and say, well, there's nothing I can do, I'm genetically cursed? What can they do at that point knowing that the deck is a little bit stacked against them already? Um, well, this, this question is actually very near and dear to me as having a family risk myself. So I'm 
extensively looked into it. Um, so the biggest thing that studies have shown that you can do is, is stay as active as possible, um, doing all the exercises that Dina mentioned, making it a variety. Um, and then the other part is education, knowing your risk, um, following up with your doctor early, checking your cholesterol early on. Um, if you're high risk, you can check your cholesterol more often than five years as recommended, um, what is recommended for a low risk individual um, starting at the age of 20. So um, there are many, many things that you can do, but the biggest thing, again, as I mentioned, is, is staying physically active throughout your life and starting that at a younger age. That's great. Um, and I want to um, talk again about women who are of a little bit of a younger age who may be considering getting pregnant. And Evelina, is there a correlation between age and risk of heart disease during pregnancy? So unfortunately, I'd love to say the fact that the older women potentially have a higher amount of heart disease. Unfortunately, being taken care of right now of 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and even 50-year-olds, I can tell you the fact that the older that you are, yes, you accumulate other uh, cardiac risk factors. You accumulate the ability of develop high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. However, a lot of women actually end up surprising us that in their 20s, all of a sudden develop um, hypertensive disease during the time of their pregnancy. And we really don't know as to why. Um, I think we mentioned during the call multiple times, the fact that 80% uh, of uh, heart disease is preventable. However, we still don't know to the full length as to why some of these 20 year olds and 30 year olds with no underlying pathology develop these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the cardiac CAT scans, the CTAs, but Jean, I wanna ask you specifically about calcium scores. Eugenia mentioned that as a way of checking on somebody's risk. Uh, what are your thoughts about calcium scores? When do you order them? And, and just to play off that question as well, how do you counsel patients about radiation risks? A lot of them are worried about radiation from nuclear scans, from cardiac CTAs, or even calcium scores. Right. So we let's 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 tackle radiation. Um, again, it's the one of the benefits of having a really good relationship with your uh, physician or healthcare provider, um, because radiation is an accumulation over your lifetime, and the greatest risks are when you're younger. And as you become older, your body kind of becomes more. Um, uh, immune to the effects of ionizing radiation, which can affect um, you know, genetic material and, and alter um, you know, cells, um, all potential precursors of, of cancer. And so um, it is important to kind of keep a uh, kind of catalog your radiation exposure over your lifetime. Uh, the nuclear stress test, the one that I was talking about earlier, where you inject the, radi the radioactive isotope in your, um, in your vein, that is, of all the tests that we talked about, that has the highest um, um, amount of radiation exposure. Uh, there are some software techniques um, that allow us to use uh, lower doses of radiation, but even with that, it still comes in as the highest. Uh, the CAT scan, uh, the cardiac CTA that you are so fond of and I am so fond of, um, we used to have an incredibly high dose of radiation exposure. The newer generations of X-ray machines, CAT scan machines, actually can have a very low dose. And um, if you're using a new generation CAT scan machine and you happen to be a, a tiny person, your radiation exposure is actually quite negligible. If you're um, bigger, more exotic, robust, I guess like me, um, you may need a little bit more radiation to penetrate and, and, and allow you to get good quality imaging. Um, the, the, the calcium score is, um, it's just a one pass through the heart. And so it doesn't really have a lot of radiation in these newer generation machines. Um, and it gives you a score. Uh, it's the Agustin score. If anyone is a fan of the South Beach diet, it, that's the same Dr. Agustin that was the, um, in, you know, the founder of that eating style. Um, 
And the score ranges from zero, which is no calcium detected, it, up into the thousands. Uh, the feel good range is between zero to 100. So in that category, we think that you are at low risk for a um, near future cardiac event. And then greater than 400 puts you into a high risk category. And so I do use, I use this modality. I will say that most insurance plans don't cover it. So it tends to be an out-of-pocket expense and many different um, Northwell Health, some of the different hospitals have a out-of-pocket payment. Usually they range somewhere between 100 to 130, $150 but you incur that cost. So my kind of thought is um, if you have insurance, let's try to do the cardiac CTA because we will get that calcium score, but we also get the picture of the vessels from the inside. And I think, um, you know, I can talk to my patients till I'm blue in the face and, and you know, about, uh, you know, plant-based diets and exercising more especially when they're sitting in the room with me, who's a little chubby and obviously not like, you know, a lean, mean running machine. Um, so presenting objective data, showing these images that have a lot of calcium and a lot of even soft plaque tends to be highly motivating for patients to commit to these changes. You know, stopping, uh, you know, cigarette smoke use, you know, tobacco sensation is uh, really, it's, it's tough, it's not easy. And, and so you really need to be highly motivated, highly committed, um, even committing to uh, an exercise routine, although they do say three weeks of, of a activity will make it memory and part of your routine. So I guess the, the key is to stick with it for those three weeks. Um, well, I, I, I hope that answers your question, but um, absolutely. And I, and I actually agree. And I think for me, that's why I like the CTAs because I find it really is the best way to motivate people when they see they actually have disease. It goes a lot, much longer way many times than just the explanation that you could have disease. I'm not sure, but probably you do. And there's so. really good data out there supporting that very idea. Uh, Cedar sinai has um, produced some really nice um you know, evidence showing that objective evidence of disease makes a difference. So um, we talked a little bit, you mentioned uh, the South Beach diet. I'm from South Florida. I get a lot of questions about what diet to eat. <laughs> um, and so Dina, I want to ask you, what is the best diet? Is there one? Or what, what would you recommend to your patients? And uh, as somebody who has a daughter who's vegetarian, um, what do you think about plant-based and vegetarian diets? Okay, well, let's start with the worst diets, if you don't mind, just for a moment, because, okay. uh, you know, it's very interesting. There are so many diets out there. As you know, on the media, we hear about new ones every day. So I would say my number one worst would be the werewolf diet. And I particularly like to go over these because these are real eating plans that people follow. And that one, people actually eat uh, juicing on lunar moons oh. twice a month. So go figure. I mean, there is some basis basis of fact in that because there is such a thing as intermittent fasting and time restricted eating. Um, but then there's the five bite diet and that is just what it sounds like. You don't have breakfast and you have five bites of lunch and dinner. Can't possibly be healthy for you. There's a baby food diet um, that's when you're a baby, but not when you're older, obviously. And then there's the, um, the, the monochromatic diets. I like to think of them as like celery, the celery juice diet, which celery is not bad, but when juiced, it takes away all the fiber and a lot of the good nutrients. And of course there's the cabbage soup diet and we can go on and on and on. And you, ma you mentioned South Beach. I put that in the bucket of the high uh, protein, um, but also sometimes high fat diets with Atkins and keto. Uh, Kourtney Kardashian was particularly fond of that one. 
as was Halle Berry, but they they actually have much, much too much fat and, and low too low on the carbohydrates. So there's a lot of bad ones out there. So what are the good ones? The good ones are a combination of the Mediterranean diet and your daughter, the vegetarian, is right on track with <laughs> cardiovascular health because plant-based eating has been shown to be really beneficial to the heart in decreasing cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. Um, there's, the, there's more um, similarities in those diets, which I consider to be the best, than they are dissimilar. And that's because they have really healthy food in them. They have mainly plant-based foods. There's um, fruits and vegetables. There's legumes like beans and peas, and there's whole grains like barley and farro and brown rices. And um, it's their, the, the other similarity is that in the vegan diet, the plant-based, there's no meat. And in the Mediterranean, there's very little meat and it's very uh, lean meat and only a couple of times a month. So there's really a lot of similarities. The Mediterranean diet allows some alcohol, usually uh, red wine, and it does have some dairy, usually in the form of a cultured dairy, like a soft cheese or a yogurt. So those are the ones that have the most uh, cardiovascular benefit of, of all of the uh, diets. And I don't like to call them diets. They're really healthy eating plans for life that you can really have fun with. Well, I love the Mediterranean, because, mostly because I love my glass of red wine every night with dinner. <laughs> But I want to um, welcome to our forum here, Dr. Katz, who's just joined us. Thank you, Stacy, for coming to our Zoom meeting. Um, it's great to see you. And I want to just bring you in. We've had a lot of talk about risk factors, um, testing, diet, exercise. But one of the biggest thing is just about advocating. You know, women are very good about advocating for the health of their kids, for their partners, but not so great when it comes to advocating for themselves. So how do you educate women to do that? No, oh, thanks. And thank you for uh, uh, tolerating my lateness. I apologize. So, so the best description of what you just described, Tarek, comes from a slide that I have borrowed from Jean Cacciabato that shows a um, upside down pyramid and it's a woman's priorities and everything goes above her. At the very bottom of this, you know, enormous uh, upside down triangle is, you know, you. Um, my other favorite part about that slide is that the dog is more important than the husband, but I will, you know, leave that to pet owners, which I am not. Um, so, 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 you know, we start with women always putting themselves last, the work comes first, the kids, you know, I'm too busy, I'll just sit in the, you know, in the dark. So, so you know, first it's giving yourself the ability to make yourself a priority and, you know, to whether or not it's doing all of your visits on your birthday month or something that, you know, makes you as important as your family and your loved ones. Um, it is being a good patient. You know, we'd never show up to the um, accountant without all of our paperwork, but somehow we'll go to a doctor and we'll assume the records there or not know our medications. So really preparing for the visit the same way. I mean, I think of all the, you know, the paperwork we do every year before April 15th, same thing, go as a good patient, write up questions that, that, that you want. You know, sometimes we're nervous in the moment. Some people like to bring someone, a family member or a friend with them, and then find a doctor who you can partner with. Um, you know, we're often asked who's the best doctor. The best doctor is a qualified doctor who you could develop a lifelong relationship with, that they hear you, that they understand what your concerns are, and they really partner with you. And Stacy, if you're not being heard by the doctor that you're with, what do you recommend a woman? Uh, you, you, you know, it, we, we, we will leave a hairdresser for one bad haircut. You know, I always <laughs> joke, we would never tolerate behavior in a, you know, a parent's doctor or our children's doctor. Find another doctor, you, you, you know, or at least have the conversation that, you know, I need more from you. Sometimes a patient will say that to me and I'll say, you know what, can you come the last appointment of the day? Because then I could sit here with you forever. Do you want to come 20 minutes before? Do you want to be called or texted? You, you, you know, have a conversation if, you know, you, you, you think this is a, a good person for you. But, but, but otherwise, you know, there's a lot of good doctors around. <laughs> um, I want to jump over to uh, Eugenia for a minute. 
We've talked about a lot of risk factors that are particular to women uh, and also how women can be different from men. But one of the big things is a woman's history of breast cancer and how she's treated for that, whether it's with chemo or radiation. A lot of women aren't aware that there could be future long-term ramifications when it comes to cardiovascular disease. So what is the connection between breast cancer, breast cancer treatment and heart disease? That's a great question. And, uh, and something that I found interesting that I learned a couple of years ago is that um, the risk factors can be common actually for the two diseases. So being sedentary, being obese, uh, cigarette smoking, um, diabetes, those put you at risk for both breast cancer and for heart disease. So obviously optimizing your risk factors would be a great way to prevent, you know, multiple diseases. So that's a, a key thing. But yes, the treatments for cancer, for breast cancer specifically in women, can lead to increased heart disease risk in the future. So the chemotherapies, it's only select ones that do actually potentially weaken your heart muscle in the long term. Not all of them universally. And if you did get one of those, then you need to have usually at least a yearly echo for at least 10 years. Um, we have more sensitive ways of tracking the function of the heart. It can be by echo, by MRI, with stress imaging from different things. Um, but that's very important to know that you got usually anthracycline or um, you know, specific ones that affect the heart to know that you have to be checked. Radiation, again, if it was radiation that was close to the heart and actually targeted the heart, that's the issue. So, and they have a lot of what they call um, cardiac sparing radiation techniques nowadays. So they're able to angle it different ways and not actually affect the heart. But if you did have radiation that was in the direction of the heart, you could have earlier plaque in the arteries. You could have valvular problems earlier than you would expect. And the last thing that I think people don't realize is also the medications. The way to uh, stop uh, breast cancer from recurring is really to block the hormones that caused it to begin with, which is estrogen and progesterone. Um, and so the common medications that are used are things like tamoxifen and um, uh, uh, arimidex and various things that really knock out um, you know, your hormonal function. And in doing that lead to sort of premature menopause, um, which we know when that happens, your risk for heart disease can go up. Um, and, you know, we just need to monitor patients through that time, make sure their cholesterol hasn't increased, their sugars remain under control, that their weight hasn't gone up, things that we can actually work on to optimize their risk long term. Well, that was a great segue to a, my next question, which was for Roshini. In terms of uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy for women who may be going through menopause. What are your thoughts about that? And should a woman uh, be counseled against it? Uh, or is she able to utilize it for certain periods of time? Um, so to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, we don't recommend HRT um, for women, um, even though we know that having estrogen is protective for us for most of our lives. Um, estrogen actually helps the blood vessels stay flexible. So um, after the estrogen levels go down, they become a little bit harder. You have a higher risk of developing high blood pressure. Um, it also keeps that HDL, the good cholesterol up, um, which is protective. And then we see a decline after the levels of estrogen go down um, after menopause. So there is no recommendation for hormone, hormone replacement therapy for prevention of heart disease. It still kind of goes back to the so the other things that we've all mentioned is, is kind of um, watching your diet, what, keeping your blood pressure controlled, keeping your weight controlled, staying active. Um, we know that a lot of the risk factors um, for heart disease and having um, being overweight or having a high cholesterol can cause menopause to start even earlier. So, you know, knowing the time asking, you know, you're telling your doctor when you're hitting menopause or, you know, watching your cholesterol even more closely after the fact um, could help you catch um, heart disease a little bit sooner. Eugenia, did you want to add something about HRT? Sure. Um, yeah, I think we exactly as a, a Dr. Milani explained, I think we don't use it specifically to prevent heart disease. I think maybe data will change over the years and we might start doing that. Who knows? But right now, what we do is if a woman has a lot of symptoms of menopause and they're not well controlled and she needs uh, hormone replacement therapy, if she's not at high risk for heart disease and really needs to be really, really well screened, 
and using the lowest doses and the most minimally invasive, then it is okay to use hormone replacement therapy. But again, specifically for the treatment of menopausal symptoms when needed. But um, you know what Dr. Mulaney explained is we don't use it, you know, to treat women, you know, for heart disease prevention right now. So speaking of hormones, uh, a period in a woman's life where there are a lot of changes in hormones, Evelina, is pregnancy. Um, we know, as you mentioned, that pregnancy and what happens during pregnancy can inform us about a woman's future risk. But what should a pregnant woman be aware of if she's experiencing signs or symptoms? What is, what is alarming and should make her say, this isn't just normal shortness of breath of pregnancy or uh, fluid in my legs? At what point should she really seek further uh, consultation? So Tara, that's a great question, considering the fact that it is sometimes very difficult for a pregnant woman to decipher what's normal, quote unquote, pregnancy related, and what uh, should be really brought up to the discussion with their physicians. So um, the old school mentality is that, you know, pregnancies uh, associated with shortness of breath or the swelling, I don't think that no and Long, no longer stands. I think that anyone that potentially has significant amount of shortness of breath or swelling or palpitations or chest discomfort, none of that should ever be really kind of poo-pooed and say it's pregnancy related until actually getting objective data, until they're actually have brought that to their attention to their OBGYN physician, who then subsequently can uh, assess objectively whether or not they send them for cardiac evaluation where we do get an ultrasound of their heart, where we do get an EKG and assess their blood pressures to make sure the fact that, that those symptoms are really pregnancy related and not anything else that is going on. Like I mentioned before, pregnancy is a stress test. During that period of time, the volume that the uh, body actually carries significantly increases. The cardiac output, which is what the heart actually ejects out of the heart to actually perfuse and get to the actual bone placenta significantly increases. That puts a strain on the heart. That kind of strain can sometimes elicit certain cardiac problems that were not known before and patients can develop symptoms. So until the point that objective data is actually obtained, to decipher as to whether or not there is or there isn't anything going on, it should never just be poo-pooed and said it's pregnancy related. Great. I know we're close to wrapping up before we take question answer, but I had just one final question for anyone who wants to answer it, which is obviously we work in partnership uh, with uh, other fields. And in particular, my question is at what point do you think about referring your patients to a nutritionist, to a psychologist or psychiatrist, to an endocrinologist? Do you tend to make those referrals pretty quickly or you know, do you wait a little bit? What, what do you feel the benefit is of having them involved in the care of your patients? I, I make it quickly, Tara, with regard to both. Um, we do a screening for anxiety and depression on new patients. Um, we take a food history and I know what I don't know. So, you know, I think those two professional components are, are um really valuable assets for our women and for me who knows what I don't know. I think just also just to, in addition to what Dr. Rosen just mentioned, I think that a lot of women actually um, appreciate the sort of multidisciplinary approach to their care and understanding the fact that there are several facets of actually to a woman. Um, Dr. Rosen, who's been my mentor forever, always taught me the fact that there's no such thing as the bikini approach to women, that there's a lot more to us. Um, so I think that explaining to the woman that making sure the fact that we're able to take care of them from the nutritional standpoint, making sure the fact that we actually have a behavioral cardiologist that actually works with us that can assess their stress level, anxiety, depression, which also all together lead to cardiovascular disease is imperative. Um, I have yeah, I, I tend to everyone. I tend to agree with everyone. I refer uh, very quickly. Um, I, I found that one of the silver linings of COVID has been that we've expanded our telemedicine services greatly. And so there are no bridges that we have to go over, like bri building bridges to go from um, any place to see another doctor. Um, our patients, especially when they have to see nutrition, um, endocrinologists, diabetologists, they can see them virtually. And so I've found that to be really very, very helpful. 
It's a great point. Rashini, I think you wanted to add something as well. Yeah, just one quick thing. I think also something to remember is a lot of women, they come from different backgrounds and ethnicities and they still really like to enjoy their, um, their, their, foods. Um, so a nutritionist has, actually can go through it with them and, and how, help them make like little changes that still help them enjoy the foods that they like, um, because that's just an important part of life. So, Absolutely. Uh, any other comments before I turn it over to Eugenia? No. Yeah, Thank you all so much. <laughs> Great job. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nerula. You always... Um, Get, guide us through all these difficult conversations. So thank you. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really getting the message out and the education that we do for the patients. And, you know, we're fortunate we do have the CATS Institute that has a platform and really great, you know, newsletters and webinars and different things. Uh, so some of this, you need to set them up with a one-on-one -on -one partner. And then some of it, we just need to make sure we provide the right educational handouts. And connect them to maybe a lecture or to, you know, some kind of program to get that education um, really that they need. But it is very helpful, I think, having things go virtual because now we have patients who are doing smoking cessation in groups in a virtual setting more than they would have before. And they're doing visits with their nutritionist or dietitian. So I 100% agree. Uh, one of the questions that did come up was about supplements and um, whether or not, you know, any of us are potentially, or there are people out there who are willing to work with respect to supplements. Um, you know, to give a general perspective on supplements with respect to research and data um, that's out there, um, there's limited uh, data that suggests that taking supplements specifically will improve your health overall. I mean, granted, if you have a deficiency, you're vitamin D deficient, or you have other problems, there's no question that you may benefit. But universally, taking a multivitamin or taking you know, various different things to improve your health. There's not a lot of data to suggest that, but getting it in your diet probably will benefit you. If you can get it into the natural forms and in vegetables and fruits and the places that these things naturally come from. But I think I have learned as a clinician, and I don't know how your perspective is on this, everyone. Um, you know, I do work with the patient. If they say to me, I will not take a prescription medication ever, ever, ever. And I will try, you know, whatever. And I'll say, okay, you know, like, we'll see what we can do you know, my opinion is that you should take X, Y, Z and I'm going to guide you and I'm going to tell you the data and you can make that choice. But, you know, we try our best to work with patients. Um, but I'm also cautious because there are, they're not well regulated, you know, supplemental industry is not really FDA approved and things like that. So you have to just be careful and it can interact with other things. So that's just in response to the uh, supplement question. Um, and someone asked, and I maybe we'll just go around with these, what exercises do you recommend for someone with a supraventricular tachycardia? <laughs> That's a, a very specific one. Uh, anybody excited to take on that one? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, so I can actually take that. There's been data to actually show the fact that, and I think that Dr. Katz mentioned that before, that yoga actually does decrease the risk of actually having atrial fibrillation, which could be considered under me umbrella of supraventricular tachycardia, but um, uh, any type of uh, exercise that potentially um, would not be incredibly strenuous, even though I love Tabata, I love Tabata rides <laughs> on Peloton, but it was mentioned before, I think those potentially may be a little bit stressful for those that do have underlying uh, tachycardia. And then also understanding that when you are exercising, your heart is going to naturally obviously increase. And sometimes patients have a hard time distinguishing as to whether or not they're having the tachycardia because of they're actually having any type of an arrhythmia or whether or not it's their own natural heart rate just speeding up. So that's where somebody like Dr. Kajibato comes into place and potentially puts them on the treadmill and gets them to do a stress test to make them understand what it actually feels like to actually feel their own natural heart rate to go up. I just want to jump in and offer an entirely different position. Um, so today we're talking more about the plumbing, the coronary artery disease of you know of the heart. There is other components of heart function. One is the electrical system, um, abnormal heart rhythms, and supraventricular tachycardia um, is, is one of those abnormal heart rhythms. It can be 
a completely cured problem. And so again, um, a good conversation with your cardiologist in consideration of a referral to an electrophysiologist, which is a cardiologist who specializes in abnormal heart rhythms, could potentially provide cure of this problem. In which case, once you're cured, have at it. Train for the New York City Marathon. You know, go go ride your Peloton for three hours in a row. Take three classes with Colby, my favorite. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not Colby, Colby, Cody, Cody. Um, anyhow, uh, just a food for thought for you to go back and maybe have a conversation with your cardiologist. Yeah, that's a great point. There are things that we don't have to really live with. Um, and I'm a conservative, I would say, cardiologist, and I do very few invasive uh, procedures when I don't you need to. But I would definitely, if I had an SVT, go and get rid of it with a procedure. Um, and, you know, because it's curative, as you mentioned, that's really, really a good point. Um, I will take one more. There's another question in the um, Q&A box uh, about genetic testing. And I'll answer it from my field and then if others have perspectives, because uh, there's a lot of different genetic testing that you can do in cardiology actually. Um, so from, I do a lot of preventive cardiology and lipid disorders, cholesterol specific. And in some cases, it's not gonna add anything. You know that somebody needs to be treated. It's very clear, you know what medications. The greatest benefit in preventive cardiology and doing genetic testing, sometimes it can guide it can do what we were discussing earlier. It's almost like when you know you have a genetic disorder, sometimes patients take it more seriously and understand what's going on and they may approach it differently. So that's very helpful. Sometimes it will be needed to get authorization for certain medications because it's only covered for certain you know, genetic uh, things. But it's most important when you can screen family members and you know, know the next generation and people who wouldn't have always been recognized, especially if they have like a borderline case, it's not obvious if they got the genetic testing, they'd know that they actually do need um, more advanced uh, testing. I don't know if anyone else uh, use it for other uh, purposes, but there's definitely a lot of different mechanisms for genetic testing in, in cardiology. For the heart muscle weakening, like if you have a cardiomyopathy or even if an aortic disorder. And interestingly, Dr. Graber takes care of uh, pregnancy patients who may have like these odd cardiomyopathies and weak muscles that may potentially even be genetic versus not, it's hard to know. Right, and I actually very rarely, similar to that, because we sometimes don't know what to do with those results. Um, it, it's good for them to know, unless they've had uh, issues in the past where they've had family members with sudden cardiac death where somebody just died from a uh, cardiac arrest um, out of the blue, um, potentially, then we would, look further into it. Um, we've looked into potentially whether or not potentially pericardium cardiomyopathies, which is a type of a weakening in the heart muscle that's related to the actual pregnancy that happens towards the latter portion of the pregnancy, uh, whether or not there's a genetic predisposition. Um, so far, the data has been quite sparse on that, um, but we very rarely um, do any of that unless, like I mentioned, there is a component of sudden cardiac death in the family. That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you. And um, thank you to all our uh, panelists for joining. Uh, one of my goals tonight was just to really, you know, there's so many things to discuss. And instead of having a lecture, we just sort of have a conversation about these important topics. And really just to show, um, you know, our whole uh, system here. So we've got Westchester, Staten Island, NASA, uh, Suffolk, uh, Manhattan, uh, all covered here. And, you know, we have an even broader uh, uh, number of uh, women in the health system. So, you know, we have experts and you should really be working with somebody who is expert at caring for this particular disease, who is going to listen to your symptoms um, and who is going to get you the right testing in order to help you get better. Um, so these are some of my favorites here uh, amongst others. So um, thank you everyone for joining us and you know, we'll be back again next month for another exciting topic. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining us and thank you to Tara for uh, guiding us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.